Now let's take a look at the data recovery aspects of using the uh, DPM. We'll talk about some of the automation that we can go through for the recovery. We'll also talk about how to recover the, the uh, data manually. And uh, also talk about um, what kind of data a user can recover, if any. Wow, starting with Service Manager. And you're probably saying, what on earth? We're talking about DPM. We're talking about uh, some of the uh, automatic recovery if you want to do it. So I have a user over here. Uh, I was going to draw a stick figure instead of a computer. All right, there we go. A <laughs> happy user uh, who is uh, going to access that self-service portal, SS uh, portal, that is connected to, of course, the service manager. And uh, what they're going to do is, uh, on that service manager, so remember, you know, they can create incidences, they can make change requests. They, well, they're going to ask for a recovery of a file. They're going to say, hey, I need to recover something. And, uh, and so we are talking about some automation. It doesn't have to always be auto, uh, you know, exactly in these steps, but uh, we want to talk about how this all works together. So they make a request to recover a file. That's kind of, you know, an incident. It could be a problem. Now, somewhere, there's a manager. This manager's job may or may not, depending on the level of automation, have to give their uh, OK on uh, the uh, approval request. Either way, whether the user has the permissions to do this themselves or the manager makes an OK uh, decision, then uh, what happens is that should trigger something over here on Orchestra to uh, start the process of doing a recovery, right? That's where we might create a run book on how to handle that particular event. Now what that uh, will do, of course, is it uh, can talk back to Service Manager as well, but its job is to then go off to uh, the DPM to initiate this recovery um, request. Now that recovery request is what the user was wanting, which is to recover a certain file. Now during all of this process, something could go wrong. Guess what? That means that Operations Manager is sitting there and looking at everybody to see what's happening here to uh, manage and maintain and uh, know that the uh, job is uh, doing what we expect it to do so that eventually from the DPM we'll be able to uh, get back to the user and be able to help them with that uh, file recovery. So what you've seen there is a complete integration of a lot of uh, the different components of the System Center and to see how you really can uh, improve, uh, you know, just the uh, way in which your enterprise is working to be able to give your, your uh, uh, enterprise more resiliency, to be able to uh, optimize how it performs, and to uh, think of this in the cloud aspect, knowing uh, what type of options a person who's uh, got files in the cloud can go through to be able to uh, take care of these very, uh, you know, what used to be maybe difficult problems. And, uh, and, you know, a lot more headache rather than just having something that's self-service. So um, that's part of the automation that we can go through then uh, in setting it up. And again, that's an integration of everything put together so that we have a complete system that a user can just sit there and say, oops, I deleted a file. Any chance I can get that file back. Now, you can also do a manual recovery through the administrative console of DPM. Now, as you're going through this process, one of the first things you have to decide is what recovery point did you want to uh, go back to? Remember, the recovery points could be as frequently as every 15 minutes. Now, a recovery point doesn't mean that you're going to take everything that uh, is at that point and restore it. You could. I mean, it could be an entire system state. But what you're saying is that I'm looking for a file that was backed up. And, and the, you know, I want to get to the last recovery point. I, it could be something as simple as saying, you know, a person says, oh, you know, I, I made some changes to a file and, uh, and I wasn't using versioning, which is a great little thing we can do in Office, um, and, uh, and I need to get back to my old file because what the changes I did were horrible and I got to redo this draft. So, you know, if it was within, the, say, that 15-minute window, we can go back to that recovery point and say, okay, let's get that one file. Now, when you do the recover, as you're going through the wizard and you're doing, going through all the steps, Right now, what we're talking about is uh, taking this file or, or whatever we want at that recovery point and restoring it back to the original location. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can restore it to a different location, to a network share, to a tape. If you do a restore like that, what you're doing is uh, potentially, let's say, an entire server crashes 
and you're saying, okay, I'm going to do a manual recovery, but now it's got to be on a new server, so I'm going to restore it to a new location. Or if you're just uh, doing what I suggested earlier, which is testing your backups, you can just go through the restore process because you're not going to change the recovery points. Don't, don't get me wrong, you're not going to change those. That process is still going on. But when you do the recover to some other location, it may very well be just a test to make sure all of that is uh, working as it should. Now, we do have to worry about security settings. We haven't gone into a lot of that uh, based on uh, the things that we've talked about so far. Uh, I mean, we've done that with a lot, most of every uh, other aspect of System Center. But uh, just like every other component, we have a role-based security system. So in order for you to be able to manually do this, you have to be a user who is a member of a role that has the ability or the rights, permissions, whatever you'd like to use as a word, to uh, work with the uh, console and to actually make this uh, recovery option. Um, and of course, also, you may want the DPM to make announcements that it just did a recovery operation and uh, have that notification sent out to uh, your recovery operator so they can keep track of what's happening and uh, when people are uh, exercising their permissions and doing different types of restores. So, um, and again, that's all through the administrator console that you can go through this process to make sure that uh, you're getting um, good interaction, you're getting the files that you need, and, uh, and like I said, for me, also testing that my strategy for backup is matching the uh, company's needs for recovery. Now, when we ask questions about what a user can recover, users can recover whatever you give them permissions to do. But I thought we'd specifically talk a little bit about uh, things that we can do for the uh, SQL Server admins and uh, giving them a self-service recovery tool. Basically, what you would do is create a uh, permissions role that configures who can recover the databases and including which databases that they can be able to recover. Now, the self-service recovery tool will take you through the process of being able to do a recover, but there's some things I want to talk about specifically uh, that deal with SQL Server, just so we have an idea of what's happening. Now, first, SQL Server does have its own backup facility. I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just saying that uh, through the use of DPM, I think you have a better backup uh, and, and more consistency and, uh, and many other uh, uh, options, including this management and restoration from this central uh, system center uh, set of components that we have. But here's the idea. The database itself is stored on a hard drive. It's an M. Uh, what is it, an MDA file or something something to, uh, to that, or an MDF, that's what it is, uh, MDF file. And, um, and, and technically, here's kind of the, the thing that happens. Let's say I've got a user who's going to uh, update a record to this database. Technically, they're updating it to a transaction log. What basically happens is, is that the record that they are wanting to change is uh, taken from that hard drive and stored in memory, then that information is uh, changed on the log and uh, recorded at that point. Now, there are going to be many changes, and at some point those changes are sent back through what they call a checkpoint. And that checkpoint is where we rewrite it to the uh, actual hard drive so it has that permanent storage. Okay, now let's take that transaction log just a little bit further. The transaction log we can look at over a value of time that here's the beginning. The dot represents the beginning of uh, some operation and it may take a certain amount of time for that operation to happen. But there may be other things going on at the same time, we would hope. And so all of these could be re or not reads, but uh, modifications of a record at some point. And, um, you know, it's uh, multi-threaded, so it can do all of this, uh, at, you know, as it needs to. And as I said, periodically we'll have a checkpoint. And that checkpoint means that what we're going to do is go through this log and we're going to look for every transaction that finished. The uh, top of the arrow here is the representation that something's finished. The reason we say that is because we only will write those transactions that have completed 100%. In this case, it looks like that one would be written. And another checkpoint occurs. And, uh, and uh, again, we're going to take uh, those things that have finished. Now, Let's imagine that, or imagine that before this checkpoint occurs, we have some horrible catastrophe. And, uh, and so we never got to the next checkpoint, and those uh, changes here and here and here never got written to the database, never got written to the hard drive. All right, so now we do the recovery. So as we're doing the recovery, uh, the recovery process, I'll put the DPM server here, 
and of course, again, letting the, uh, the database person do this, the DPM process is going to start restoring the MDF file, the, the database, and all of the components that are in there. And, uh, and, and of course, it may or may not restore it to the same database. It, you may have to restore it to a different SQL server just because, just because uh, maybe that server is completely crashed and so it's gone. Uh, you know, it just depends on, on what it is that we're looking for. So we do the recovery and, uh, and it's going to have everything except for, guess what, these things that occurred in the transaction log. So as you do the recovery, wherever you, uh, you do the recovery, you have a couple of options uh, when you set this up. One is, you could say, leave the database operational. Well, if you leave the database operational, what you're basically saying is that now go ahead and start making your changes uh, and put this thing into production, into production. If I take that option, I am still losing this information about the checkpoint. And now the checkpoint files, these transaction logs, I should say, these files are certainly available. They may be a part of the backup that we're already doing, but now we've lost the ability to uh, get changes that uh, somebody thinks had actually committed, that somebody thinks is actually a permanent part of uh, what they've done. So another option you can have is that you can leave this database non-operational, and that means, of course, that the database is still down. Remember, we have to uh, consider the fact that um, the, uh, the time to the recovery might be important for us as well. But what it does is it uh, basically, we're going to recover uh, the database at some recovery point that uh, we have with the uh, uh, Data Protection Manager. And then what we're going to do is we're going to leave it uh, in a non-functional so that we can replay the necessary transaction logs. Now, replaying the transaction logs means that we, at some point, copied the logs and we're going to replay them. By replaying them, we start going through this time and we start uh, making sure we write all of these changes that occurred, successfully occurred, so that we can uh, make sure that they're actually stored in the uh, database. So uh, that means that the logs are being applied. Now, that's a normal part of the process that we always do anyway when we're using, even using the backup and restore features that come with SQL Server. But uh, the, the uh, important part here is that you have the ability to get to that point to uh, be able to uh, allow uh, the, all of the data that you have to be able to be recovered to the best point possible. Now, it may very well be, and, and don't get me wrong, these transactions that did occur could have been the thing that was bad. The reason I say that is, let's imagine that somebody uh, was disgruntled and they said, uh, delete star. <laughs> so, so they deleted all of the records out of your table. Uh, and, and it was successful. That means that now we've written those changes. And let me tell you what, once, once that occurs, once a transaction is committed, I, I mean, we have options with transactions, but once it's committed, it's done. We, there is no go back. There's no undo button that we have. And so, you know, in that case, you may be happy to go to the last restore point where the records were before they deleted it and, uh, and then go make sure that you, um, you know, if there is a transaction log that does have some other changes, to make sure that you're being very careful about going uh, and doing the restore back to a certain point of time so you can recover all of the information that uh, was um, lost with that kind of an action. So not everything that you do as a recover is because of failure. It could be because of user error or uh, a user just trying to uh, do something malicious. Now, as I mentioned, this is a part of what we have with DPM, and there is a tool called the DPM Self-Service Recovery Tool, and it's designed for SQL Server admins so that they can go through and, uh, as I said before, they can choose the database that they want to be able to recover. I mean, these are kind of the options that they're going to have. They'll be asked first to choose the database that uh, is important to them to be able to bring back to life. In that, they're then going to be asked for the recovery point that they want to restore to. Remember, the recovery points are based on time. So I'm going to be able to restore to a certain point in time. Then they're going to be asked for the recovery type that they're uh, going to be performing. Now, remember, as far as the type, we can uh, do this to uh, other locations, like to a, uh, you know, a, a new SQL server, if we want to. 
Then they're going to be asked for the recovery state. And the recovery state is what I just dis uh, discussed down here. And then depending on the type of, uh, of uh, information that they're uh, looking for, you uh, may have some other uh, minor recovery options, maybe uh, dealing with uh, communication supports or how to get through firewalls that uh, are also an important uh, part of doing this process. Again, it just depends on uh, understanding the network and how to get from the DPM uh, location of where the backup is to the actual SQL server. So that's what they're going to find in this self-service recovery tool. And, uh, and so again, you hopefully are seeing the strengths of having DPM out there for us to uh, help keep your network up or bring it back to life as quickly as you can.